Well, I am Adriano Musa. I am the Dean, uh, Academic Director and Artificial Intelligence Director of St. Paul and, and LEAD. Uh, this event is part of our high-impact programs, uh, especially RT Riding Through Chaos. Uh, it's our program in partnership with Chaos Pilots. Uh, the title of this event is a question. And uh, uh, in a few, a few minutes, I'm going to explain why. The question is, why don't current frameworks work on complex and chaotic environments? So first of all, uh, let me introduce our speakers. Um, we have Jose Claudio Securato. He is the CEO and founder of St. Paul and LEAD. Uh, he holds a PhD in economics uh, from University of Sao Paulo. And certainly, he's one of the masters in our country in digital transformation, disruption, innovation, etc. Uh, Dr. Christer from Chaos Pilot Denmark, he is the CEO and principal of Chaos Pilot, uh, one of the masters in innovation, strategic management, leadership in complex and chaotic environments. Uh, he has a PhD in innovation and complexity uh, from Tobard University in Holland. So uh, thank you uh, everyone for being here, uh, attending this webinar. Uh, I hope that you can enjoy it. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, asking to Jose Claudio to talk a little bit about um, our programs and especially about uh, RGC and then we are gonna we are gonna start with uh, a debating uh, talking uh, with Chris and just the cloud hmm. uh, just like cloud your microphone at that it's off can you hear me N now we can okay so thank you very much for your introduction and thank you all to be here virtually uh, in this webinar. I'm, I'm very pleased to receive here uh, Professor Christer. He's a great friend uh, and since January of 2018, we have been working together um, to, to challenge the business administration and to bring in something new for Brazil uh, to address the, the, the diversity, the unexpected, and uh, the problems that we have to solve here. Uh, I have this, this first slide to share with you just to give you a context. And uh, uh, it, it's in Portuguese, so it's easy for all of you to understand, but I, I will read in English so Christer could follow us. I, I, and I know that he he shared his ideas too. We have discussed this mm -hmm. a lot. And uh, uh, I believe the most challenge and great moments in the history because of the, uh, the changes that we have. And uh, all these changes were in course and uh, was in course and uh, the coronavirus and, uh, and all the situation that we are living now, they are just in making this revolution faster. And uh, we are living from this left side of the, the, the slide to the right side of the slide. So uh, I call it here in blue, the, the word of yesterday and the word of today, uh, just to give you a simple name for this change. But I could give you different explanations, how we are changing the world and how we change our lives and how we will change the way we work. So we need to, to change the way we address uh, uh, problems, uh, address innovation. And uh, if I could speak just two minutes about this change, I would say that uh, I could talk about uh, 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 different different lengths. So uh, the most important one is the first one uh, when we believe that uh, the relation between people is changing dramatically. 
So we are changing to uh, uh, a vertical uh, structure in the society to a horizontal structure in the society. And this will change everything. Uh, the second change would be in neuroscience. We are talking about the cognitive to the non-cognitive uh, value of the ideas, the thinking and the knowledge. philosophy uh, way of thinking and here we are talking about ethics and aesthetics and not in the in, with a, a very special meaning of these words so i'm not talking about ethics as we usually know i'm talking about a, a, a philosophy definition of these terms so it's a very different meaning too uh, i think the most simple is to address the technology we all know we are being packed by that with linear technologies to exponential technologies and uh, in the last one i'd like to address how we solve problems and uh, we uh, are much more uh, used to address problems and perhaps not complex and chaotical chaotical problems so uh, this this scenario of changing will will of course, change the what are the things that you need to study, what you need to develop, and how you work. And uh, when we think about high impact programs, uh, we need to think how can we make a really and, and a truth uh, impact in the society. And now of this course need to be a really deep in content and uh, uh, help us to address all these changes. In Riding Through Chaos, we would like to address a very special part of all of this. Uh, first of all, because we are going to talk about complex and chaotical problems and, uh, uh, and how to deal with them. We're going to talk about how to solve, how to address complex problems. How can we dance? With the chaos, how can you uh, ride into the chaos? So through the chaos. So uh, this is the idea and the context that we are talking uh, here uh, today. Uh, what should you expect about this program uh, and these webinars? And how can we uh, understand the complexity, the chaos, and uh, why can we not think about the word of yesterday to solve problems of today. So uh, I will stop here and uh, 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 send the word to Adriano so he can start with the questions and we can debate all of this. Thank you. That is a, it's a great basis for our discussions. And now uh, I'd like to start our questions to, to, to Christer. Uh, and first of all, and I think that it's important in order to contact, contextualize, mm. Krista, how can we identify so complicated, uh, complex and chaotic problems or situations? And why is it so important for leaders? And uh, I mean, uh, it, it's very common in a common sense. We, we always say, oh, my schedule is a chaos. Uh, my 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 day is like is chaotic. Uh, so so how can we escape from this common sense view and go uh, to a, a deep vision? How can you start with that? Mm. Thank you for that and hi to everyone. I'm um, lovely to be here and together with Jose Claudia and you, Adriano. Um, is it true that the terminology when we speak about complexity and chaos, etc., is wide, widespread? We use this terminology sometimes in a more proper way, perhaps we would say from a scientific perspective, and sometimes we just use it in, in general terms. The, um, <clears throat> I would say that the perceptiveness of what this means, particularly within a managerial situation, has grown throughout the last three, four decades, and maybe not more than in within, within the last two decades, has become really, really prominent. 
And the main reason for that is that we more and more recognize that we make strategies, we make plans, but they never really become as we intended. That is like the core thing. How can that be? Rarely do a complete idiot become a CEO. It's not very often that happens. And normally people that end up in management groups are there because of their abilities, their proven expertise. It's not just so that today that most people that end up in managerial groups are assholes or idiots. That's not it. Normally they are there because that they know something, they have done something. And the old perspective is very much that when that is, you have been selected for a position like that, surely you must know better. You should be able to devise a strategy. You should be able to say how the world will unfold. However, more and more we recognize that this is not the case. Even the, the famous military, military uh, General from Jeremy Moltke said, "Any no plan survives the meeting with the reality, right? But to some extent within business, we have a hard time to fully accept the consequence of that. And all of this resource very much to that classical Newtonian sciences, where we were able, where we deduced, where we analyzed, will be able to help us predict better and not just better, but accurately. And here we then face the challenge that we rely very much on our managerial thinking on a theory which at best has a limited, limited uh, value. Okay. Just a cloud, we are not hearing hearing you. And uh, can you hear it now? I think I moved this yeah. short delay. Okay, uh, Christopher, and how will CEOs and uh, leaders uh, worldwide uh, have 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 this perception? Uh, uh, do they know that the plan and the reality uh, doesn't fit so well? And uh, why they don't stop to use uh, some th the same methodology? Mm. See, this is an interesting and quite difficult question because I think that many good CEOs actually know, but in, but there are many other consequences because if you look at imagine you as a CEO, you are meeting your board and they say. So tell us what the world will look like in three years so we can make proper decisions on the development of this company. And you as a CEO says, I have no clue. Then the natural response is very often, well, we hired you for having a clue. So that is one perspective of this that it's hard to lose face in a way. It's hard to be the not knowing person in the room when your job is that to be that person. So to hold that uncertainty has, I think, for many people in leadership position been viewed as a weakness. It is not a strength to position your uncertainty. The idea of the CEO is this strong man, right, that stands at the end of the table and points with the whole hand as the, that's the direction. That's the way we should do it. And that often makes us jump ahead over a number of important questions. The other one side to that is maybe the bit more of the subtleness, which is not just about the psychological aspect or the social stigma of being a leader, but it resorts back to the tools and methods that we have been trained in, the worldview that we obtained when we took our degrees from business school, when we started to get our first job, our toolbox, is filled with a number of tools that essentially is a result of this positivist tradition. I'm not saying that none of them, that they don't work. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying we use the tools that we have been trained to use. So as you said, when suddenly the, the land or the landscape isn't really exactly fitting with the, the, the map that we have, 
it's difficult for us to reinvent the map. We don't have the tools to reinvent that map. So there are like two yeah. sides to that one. Yeah. And Christer, uh, when you say about two box, no, uh, when we when we analyze um, MBA programs around the world, no, uh, we can summarize them in frameworks. No, it's mm. uh, yes. Canvas framework and uh, X framework, yeah. uh, and uh, they, they they work very well in 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 un, until complicated situations. Mm. Uh, why do we say that? That these must be used frameworks are 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 toolbox. You no, know, uh, they, they don't work in complexity. No. So I think that one of the things which, in honor of more classical MBA programs and much of those tools that have been developed over the last 50, 60 years, they can do. They do have value. It depends very much on the situation, and even. But I think the most important thing we can train our future leaders in is the idea that a tool is just a tool. It is not the answer to every single situation. It's like for the carpenter, the hammer is a fantastic tool, but you cannot use it for everything. And the difference between my young son and a professional carpenter is how they use the tools. And what we will see, I think, in, in that respect is very often that people become better in knowing at what time, in what situation would a tool be applicable? When is it valuable? And understanding the limitations to whatever we do. So part of the whole development, I think, for leaders in our complex society is the realization that what I'd learn is not necessarily wrong, but I need to understand its limits. Great. Uh, you, you disappeared a bit from me when you when you asked the question. Did I answer the uh, your question correctly? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Adriana, can I make a question? Yeah, of course. And uh, and and and, and Chris, uh, Considering that we, we have the tools and they are important, uh, yes. and I, I, I like that when, when you say that uh, we don't have the tools to reinvent the map. So we've don't we've need to reinvent the map. So our way, our our uh, next step, uh, we need to think about creativity mm. and. Uh, uh, to give an expect and to, to get a next step. So how creativity is important in this area? Yeah. I, I um, at one during the financial crisis, I heard a, a person that had said um, something about it was a response to 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 more creative schools. And, and he said it's it's the creativity that has brought us into this mess. And I think what he pointed to is that people that work predominantly within the financial industry, when they become too creative, we do have a problem. <laughs> and and, um, and I, my response was, uh, as a note to that one was, yes, but it will also be creativity that will get us out of this problem. That we will, that's part of the human nature. And creativity for me is something that it, that goes, it strikes at the very core of being a human being. It is part, it's not just that necessity provokes creativity. It does, and maybe we will become more active in it, but creativity is something that happens from the day we're born until virtually the day we die. We don't necessarily think about it all the time. So creativity in this way, I think will be the main reason or the main resource we have to draw upon why we need to look at the world differently. We need to invite ourselves and other people into not just assuming things and perhaps attack it from, uh, from, a, from a perspective that no one of us thought about before. So creativity is that power that we have been bestowed with that can really allow us to move away 
from the, the, the map that doesn't work anymore. In addition, of course, creativity is not the only thing. So you guys, or most of you probably listening, live in a country that at least from a European centric perspective was discovered five, 600 years ago. Was that purely due to creativity? No, there were probably some other qualities involved. There were probably something involved with, with um, courage. There were maybe something that is more questionable in terms of ambition, ruthlessness, and certain other elements. So the human endeavor for understanding the world and reinventing our understanding of the world is a very complex matter in itself. What actually allow us to look at the world if you just take this pandemic situation that we are all now part of, before this session, I looked into the newspapers before the COVID was really, really a, a big challenge in Denmark. What did we talk about? Well, we talked about immigration. We talked about environmental issues. We talked about retirement. We talked about the government's new policy for economical stimulus. Then suddenly the COVID happened, happened and we don't talk about anything else than that. So suddenly, all the nucleus that are part of creating the, the, um, the narrative around what is important now is something that we actually affect. And I think very much the same way when it comes to uh, when we think about organizations. At one point in time, there will be enough movement. So our paradigms will simply change. And in my particular world, the translation from physical education to more online or blended learning is one of those. Suddenly for us in our small, small aquarium around Chaos Pilot, the paradigm is changing quite rapidly actually, due to this outside changes that forces us in this direction. Could I have made a plan about that? No, I could not have foreseen the Corona. Obviously, we talked about pandemics before, but it was always something that was out there. It wasn't really going to change something here. Great, Christer. Uh, something that uh, is very important is we were not trained to be uh, creative. No, we were trained to, to, to use frames, to use tools. How yes. can we, as adults, develop creativity or mm. uh, innovative or, or, or have have the right mindset for innovation mm. how what could you suggest so if we look at um, i don't i think in my experience what i've seen is that everyone has creativity but not everyone is necessarily picasso right <laughs> I will never play on the Brazilian national football team, even if I have some, some qualities, we, we are different. And in, so when it comes to creativity, I think there are, there are ways to go about, there are science that can help us understand how to promote creativity. And some of these solutions are quite banal, but a bit surprisingly, we do not do it. For instance, we know that um, a green plant on your table tend to promote creativity. It sounds ludicrous and it sounds banal, but it's true, but we don't. And if you, if you amplify that worldview into organizations, most of us have a fair idea of when they feel that they are creative and when they engage in things and they say, yeah, I actually was part of making something that was slightly different. And one of these key aspects is the relational view of man. People may be creative in isolation, that they can come up with solutions, but they need stimulus. No one can be locked into a tower for 50 years and come out being more, more creative. We can certainly be, people say, I need to think on my own. That's probably true. Many of us do find, come up with solutions when we think of our own and we ponder a problem when we work on it, but we need stimulus. And the relational aspect is one of those, I would say, those strange forces that really 
spurs our creativity. So in terms of organizational work, I think one of the most important aspects is to strike the balance of designing for relational things to happen, designing for the unexpected to happen, at the same time designing for reflection, contemplation, and in-depth work. And I think many of our organizations do not do that. For instance, I have been part of an organization that maybe worked completely into the whole of relational connection. We had an open landscape. People met all the time. Everyone spoke in the same room. There was never silence. There was never time for contemplation, reflection, etc. We were like the epiphany of the idea that if people are just together, good things will come out of it. It was lovely. Was it very productive? No, not necessarily. So there needs to be a balance between the two. And here, some organizations which we have worked with are maybe more in the other end, that people are very isolated and they do not engage in activities that forces them beyond their safety, their comfort zone. And creativity happens the minute you break from the comfort zone into the new, the uncertain, because that's what spurs the creativity to happen. It's like when you go on a holiday. Go to a holiday to a place where you have never been, you don't know the language, and you lose your mobile phone. <laughs> then suddenly you're confronted with all the things that we knew 30 years ago, but we completely have forgotten. <laughs> and, and and Christa, uh, as we don't have the tools to reinvent the map, as we don't have the tools to uh, to innovation, uh, or not for all kinds of innovation to solve all kinds of problems, you're gonna have to design our way. You're gonna have mm. to design the plans. Uh, uh, can you talk a little bit more about how the competence of design is so important? in mm. this new environment yes so it's it's very true and part part of that that we don't have that toolbox that doesn't mean that we don't have anything mm -hmm. we have again we have certain tools frameworks methods that help us so the more important aspect on that journey is the mindset the orientation to how do i engage with what i have and how do i effectively apply, try, test, and see what actually works. Design as, as a theme has obtained a lot of prominence, as obviously you know in Brazil as well. And uh, the company IDO really spurred the idea of design thinking. And the merge between design towards business is a relatively new phenomenon, maybe 20 years when it really started to happen. And we see today a number of design agencies and creative agencies being, being bought effectively by large classical consultancies, management houses, because they want to tap into that world. So what is it that design holds? Well, again, design can be seen as a view of how to obtain progress. And as such, it takes the position of outside in perspectives for the company. It allows us to, to adopt or try to adopt the view of the customer, understanding the problem from a, from a multiple reality perspective, though, rather than from the single probably dominant discourse from the company. So it allows us to move beyond ourselves and to think differently about whatever that we try to accomplish. Now, that classical view of, like we know from Brown and some of the other historical designers, like function over form, some of those principles have then been adopted to some, I would, I would argue, to some, to some effectiveness, and some people that are, are very good in adopting the, these type of things. Some are less because they, again, think of it as the tool. This is the only tool. It will solve all my problems. I'm great at design thinking processes. Everything will work. Again, it comes down to 
the quality of the person using the tool as well as the appropriate situation for that actual tool. And design thinking as such, more than anything in my view, allow us to think broader and wider around, for instance, innovation that we normally do. And it's a great support when we go about strategic thinking, strategic planning in a different way than we did maybe 20, 25 years ago. Christer, um, I, when I visited the EU last year, I think that the most impactful thing that I have learned was that uh, simple problems, we can solve them. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, we can analyze them and solve them. Yeah. But complex and chaotic problems, we will probably never solve, solve them. We are gonna dance with them, and yes, yes, that's yes. very important. But but I, I I this thought was on my mind uh, for is in on my mind for months, and um, it's a little bit frustrating, isn't it? Because if I receive my money, I am the CEO or I am the C level, and I receive my salary to solve problems. Mm. Everyone expect that I can I can solve all kinds of problems. But if I will not solve, uh, how to deal with that? It, it's really, really hard. Yeah, yes, it's, it's very true. And uh, I think there are a few interesting perspectives on this. And, and one, as you, as you said, can every problem be solved? I think part in the testimony to the human ingenuity I think we can solve actually a lot of problems, particularly if we are given time and resources to do so. However, very often solving a problem reveals an ocean of new problems or sophistications to that problem. The problems that when we think about complicated or complex problems, they are not, as you said, they don't really go away. We work with them, we dance with them, we temporarily solve them. And, and you can see this actually from an organizational perspective too, that many of the things we engage in, they simply is not a problem to be solved once. It's an ongoing process. So take for instance, the. Um, let me give you a very simple example from my own reality. Every year, a number uh, of students are supposed to enroll at our school. And we can view that as business as usual, which is true. On several, that is absolutely true. But on one level, we can also view this as singular projects defined in time that happens every year. And if you analyze this, maybe what has happened throughout the last 15, 20 years, the problem to be solved holds different characteristics. How to find the students, how to make them interested or understand what it is we have to offer, how that changes our product, our marketing in all of that. So we solve things more temporarily than definitively these days in our in organizational matters. Hasn't that always been the case? Well, probably. But to a large extent, we never thought about it like that. Now, with complexity theory, we understand that by coming up with one solution, it is not the eternal solution. It's a temporary solution. Another thing is that when we look at problems, in order to solve them, if we avoid a strategy that is basically luck-based, I was fortunate. I was able to solve it. I have no idea how I did it. It was sheer luck. Most of that re 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 requires some level of understanding and some level of sophistication in our work with them. Very often today, when we look at problems, we cannot fully understand them. We cannot fully define them. So even if we take away the aspect of time and look at this more in terms of of here and now type of things that they would be relatively static we simply lack information and how can that be well part of it is that we normally isolate problems and say this is the problem 
and we do not factor in the feedback loops that happen from everything around the, that surrounds that problem. So what that requires from us is a different sensibility to the world. And it requires something of us understanding that we are part of a process that continues forever. So it's more, again, a change of views of the world around the change. Yeah. I think that Brister is reconnecting. É, Adriano, acho que ele está reconectando. Enquanto ele reconecta, deixa eu ver se ele já voltou. Am I back? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened actually. The, um, it's one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what is what is what is Adriano? Perhaps it would be interesting also to listen to you and also Claudia a little. What is your view in all of this? Uh, let, let me start with the the problem that we have now, that is the uh, <laughs> coronavirus. And uh, yeah, uh, listen to you today and the other times that we, we were together. I think I think people are expecting that the government have frames and straight solution uh, for the pandemic and for the crisis as uh, it was like a simple problem that we can say go to the microphone and say to the world okay the solution is that uh, yes. today we have uh, this number of people in the hospitals and uh, our, this number we will have this kind of evolution and we know what kind of curve mm. it will be, and uh, but it's it's very clear that we should dance with the complexity and uh, mm. with the problem that we have now, and, uh, mm. and and we have another problem that if you have a politician, and a, a, a president, a prime minister, a governor, a major, that uh, dance with the problem and uh, give small solutions, small gains, and uh, uh, problem of this person will be must be very smart to communicate that. Yes. To not know that they th this person uh, don't know what is what what they they are doing. So. Uh, 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 I think the problem and uh, how to deal with the problem and how to communicate to how you are dealing with the problem uh, have to be considering this in this scenario uh, applying this to the moment that we have and yeah. uh, when i see the perspective inside the organizations uh, i i'm really convinced that people are afraid about innovation and uh, it's much more simple to uh, 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 have a target like a quarter, mm -hmm. and uh, if I have to run 100 miles, I, I have to, I will do that. If I have to jump three meters, I will jump that. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's easier because we learn mm -hmm. how to deal with this kind of challenge. It's not easy mm -hmm. to do that. It's not easy mm -hmm. to to be on budget to to uh, sell more than the 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 budget was yeah. uh, have defined it's it, it's not easy definitely but uh, i'm sure that this kind of executive will not do uh, anything different uh, anything you mm know -hmm. in, in with innovation and uh, mm -hmm. and i think people have to should be uh, even and 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 uh, let me just give a, a step back. The problem uh, in the government to communicate how to solve the crisis, mm. uh, if it solve but it's not problem, is not we are not uh, it's not we are not able to solve a problem. But mm. 
how can I deal with the problem, with the crisis, mm. with the coronavirus, and uh, this difficult that the politicians have? Yes. I think the CEO and the, all the senior executives have the same problem, yes. because yes. Uh, the the people around them expect, as the population expects, as the citizen um, expect, that you have a great solution for everything. Mm. So. Mm. Uh, we are dealing with something that we have to be more um, open to understand mm -hmm. that people people don't don't have the answer for the things, and we have to build together. Uh, yeah. And uh, I like when you I like very much when you say that design it's how we can obtain progress, mm -hmm. and uh, progress is more important than solution. Mm. Yes, I agree. I'm not sure, sure how much in Brazil that you follow the uh, Corona situation here in Northern Europe, but there are some interesting aspects to what you are saying. And um, so the, the five countries we have, like Iceland, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, w there is only one country that has a strikingly different strategy in working with Corona than the others, and that is Sweden, which has remained relatively open. It is also the only country that has a male prime minister. <laughs> and the number of deaths is extraordinarily high in relative to the number of people. If you would compare, for instance, to Denmark, it's more than four or five times higher than it should be. Yeah, four times. And. Uh, but if you look at Sweden, that it's a very expert-driven type of society. That's normally how Sweden portrays itself. The expert says that there are no proven strategies that make that we can believe in. So we believe that what science tells us. Science says that uh, some sort of immunity will eventually come, and we just have to wait it out while we wait for the vaccines, and we try to do the precautions that we can. This is then, it seems a fair approach. From a Swedish perspective, yes, the science tells us this, we should do that. However, if you look at that strategy, it resides on a number of points, because it's not so that the science in Sweden or politicians would like a lot, a lot of people to die. That's not it. So they say we need to protect the vulnerable people. The particular the old people at the, at the, at the elderly homes and so forth. Mm -hmm. And you say, okay, so that is a key aspect. We believe that the right way is this way. But in order to ensure that the cost is not too high, we try to do these things where we limit the spread, particularly towards older people. How have that succeeded? Not very well. And then you can ask yourself, how can that possibly be? Because we have obviously in Sweden, we know where the elderly homes are. We know who works there. We can prevent people from entering. How difficult can that be? Well, then you have the systemic problem. Some of these elderly homes are not run by the government. They are private institutions. And the costs extra incurred if you actually lock them down or you introduce new ways of preventing. Maybe you need to educate staff differently. Mm -hmm. It is not so easy to enforce this in a, in, a, in, a, in a democracy and where you have a number of players. So you devise a strategy that actually looks really well and people buy into it. Then in the implementation phase, there are a number of obstacles that you did not factor in. You could not know that, for instance, or no one really thought about that, that healthcare personnel in Sweden are maybe not exactly the same people as in Denmark. There are different qualification levels. They are located in different, in different areas. So suddenly you have a situation where this happened. And then when the strategy do not play out in full, in perfect, it's suddenly you see another dilemma which we do have in organizations, and that is the political aspect of being a leader. Because as you so rightly point out that 
we cannot necessarily say that we don't have any answers. There is a political agenda to most problems or challenges or strategies in an organization. Some people are in favor of certain things. Some people are not. As a leader, you also need to obtain buy-in. You need to have support. In most organizations, it is not God that decided that you would be in that chair. Someone has elected you or appointed you, which means that they can also move you away. So that coalition building, that that obtaining the support as a leader is actually quite important. And in in the modern organization, where the distance between the leader and the leader's authority and with everyone else, it's a much, much more difficult to space to be in. You cannot lock yourself into the C-suite and wait for the world to happen outside. Very quickly, the, can the, the winds can really change around you and your job. So the political side to being a leader is an increasingly important aspect. So how then can you just say, well, something new is happening. I'm not sure what that is. I think all of that points back to something that you said uh, in this corona thing that we can learn from. Maybe some of those qualities that we see tend to be favored by people in countries, in Scandinavia at least, are qualities that we normally don't associate with leaders that are male. Maybe these females, the female leaders we are, have been better in facilitating information, gather a broader spectrum of voices before making decisions, and also maybe not portraying their decisions as being the best decisions, or not portraying them to be, we guarantee this will work. Maybe they have been a bit better in saying, we need to do this. We cannot guarantee this, but we can guarantee that if we don't do this, we have a bigger problems at hand. And they display something that I think is a key aspect in all of this, both from an instrumental perspective, but also from a political, and that is empathy. Leaders need to portray a lot of empathy in complex situations, because we as people can live with leaders to a large extent that make decisions that are not perfect if we believe that they see us, if we believe that they hear what we are saying, if they can feel what we are feeling, we give these leaders much more authority than what we would else would be. If you believe that they are assholes, that they're tone deaf to what everything goes around them, it is it is more raw power that keeps them in, 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 in position rather than competence or perhaps other qualities. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, I agree with you, and I would like to add one aspect. I think that it's technology, especially mm -hmm. because when when we think about artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain, IoT, etc., uh, we have we already have AI, or we are gonna have in the near future AI um, is gonna be much better than we are to solve simple problems that that's the mm. truth yes. uh, so we it's imperative that our leaders uh, uh they they must focus in complex and chaotic problems because because if you're gonna have ai solving uh and it's true now no it, it's a reality now uh, if you're gonna have AI uh, better and better uh, in the near future, I think that it's imper imperative that to, we have mm. to focus on 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 complex problems. But mm. uh, it's not easy because, uh, as as you said at the beginning, we were not trained to to act like that. So we are gonna have to develop new skills and fast. And it means uh, be out of the comfort zone because uh, I, I am uh, if I am an executive, uh, senior executive, I I reach at this point solving problems, mm. uh, and I am very good doing that. 
But mm. now I have to be really out of my comfort zone, and it's not natural. You know? uh, I have to learn uh, to to uh, to to be a new professional, and uh, we know that it's not it's not easy. But I really think that process is going to be accelerated by that, and it's being accelerated by technology. Yeah. I, I, I believe, and what I do too hope is that with this new technology, maybe it will fr free up some resources where you as an organization maybe have more of a, you can almost call it a radar system towards global changes, things that are coming your way that you could not really see. It wasn't so that we could not foresee that a pandemic. Most of our uh, countries have already said, yes, that will happen. We know that will happen. We were not just fully prepared for this pandemic. So there is something else as an organization that we can be have a bit of a radar system towards figuring out what actually goes on in the world and how that may how may that may actually affect us. And with technology, there will be so many things that I think that are possible. If, if I just take again my own organization, as what we can see is we spoke earlier about creativity. And we can see that it was, we have fared relatively well and, th and partially because that we have been making some money in the past. So we are not suffering in the same way as many other organizations now. But also we have a creative, uh, I call it <coughs> creativity capacity. So meaning that when all of these suddenly exploded we had an organization that very quickly could utilize the space that was created and try to work out new creative solutions and here technology can both be helpful in terms of a providing new information it can make connections that we could not necessarily see between different type of information but it can also allow us people to focus more on these things that are really difficult to put into a machine, basically. So there are so many levels where technology can help us to reach a new level and be better catered for managing the unmanageable. Great. Great. Uh, uh, Christian and Jose Claudio, we have some. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Jose Claudio is going to add. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ask some questions that we received from our audience previously. Please use the cloud. Okay, so very uh, very quick question, uh, Christian. Can you tell us uh, how is a class in Chaos Pilot and what do you bring to Brazil uh, in mm. our program right through Chaos? So I I I I manage a very different methodology. So can you share? A little bit with us, please. Yes, yeah, so we, um, the pillar of Chaos Pilot Education is effectively action based learning, meaning that very often we, um, or most often, we actually engage in working on something. And, and then we add reflection and we add theory towards the end. It varies a little, but in comparison with many other educations, our approach is quite the contrary. We do the opposite of what people do, where they normally start with theory, then they add a bit of reflection and questions, and then they do stuff. So ours often then moves from the other way around. When it comes to complexity, we do have a number of, of, of methodologies, tools, etc., that we work with. Many of these are relational oriented. So how do you work with other people? And part of this program, we will bring some of these tools and people will experience how can I be a better collaborator? How can we work with decision making when we don't know all the answers? We will bring about also some different frameworks of how to look at the world and how to apply strategies and leadership approaches to that world all of that we normally also provide i wouldn't say all of it some of it we provide to our students and and um, but some of them are sophisticated and it requires maybe more experience than the bulk of our students would have so they would more fitting into a program like this many of these has been tested throughout the last 20 
20-ish years, I would say. So they have stood this test of time. And we have seen that they have been very, very, very effective. And it's not just a model. So for instance, we worked a lot with the, with the founder of the Visa card and his development of a, a view for a tool for organizational change that are in the intersection between chaos and order. And he called that chaotic. That was his way to look at how to move and re reinvent organizations. The model is very, for instance, very, very straightforward. It's very, actually very easy to grasp it. The challenge is how to become good in applying it. And this is very maybe why Chaos Pilot programs are so appreciated by others. It is not just the introduction of a tool. It is that we, in our sessions, we try them. We work with them. We offer perspectives. And we normally do that by viewing every participant as a teacher. We would expect that every participant in a program like this that we run, that their contribution is critical to the development of themselves, but also to everyone else engaged. So I think that people will have a experience a slightly different look and feel than what they are normally uh, accustomed to. And hopefully I, uh, they will join in and they will have a bit of fun when we do this. We uh, we think it, actually learning comes much more easy if, if we enjoy being there rather than we hate it. So normally our, our trainings are, are quite deep, but they're also quite light because it's not so theory heavy. It's about application. It's about trying, testing, experimenting, exploring. And then there is a library or things that you can engage with. But when we meet, we, we normally tone down a bit of the lecturing and do more work. So we get our hands dirty. And when we leave these sessions, we say, yeah, I know how to do that. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. So uh, we have some questions from our audience. And please, if you have some questions, please uh, write it down in our, in our chat on the right side of, of your screen. Uh, Samia Paiva, she asked, uh, I think that we talked a little bit about, the, about it, but risk management is about future certain events. How can we continue to forecast scenarios in this chaotic scenario? Hmm. Well, it's a good question. It's a difficult question because you could have a position that says, well, every, if everything is uncertain, everything is unknown, what's the point? But here I think there are two things that comes to play. One is that the ability to craft out new scenarios is actually a, a key ability of companies, of leaders, that you constantly actually work with what could happen and we prepare ourselves from those things basically by de developing some sort of recognition patterns in all of that the other thing which is sometimes underestimated in all of this is that and that's resource back to what was Claudia talked about creativity scenarios is not just something that only happens to us we are actors we are players we could feasibly try to make a scenario happen. And there's sometimes when you read about complex theories and we think about organizational matters to say, it's better to wait and see what happens and then we quickly adjust. Well, that's one strategy. But one, one another way to look at it is that we have developed four or five scenarios. We think that this one would prove to be most um, beneficial for us. So you try to work in that direction. But where com com complexity really differs from other things is that there is no guarantee. We know that there is no guarantee that just because that we made that scenario, that may not happen. But as we work towards that scenario, the key aspect is how do we learn from what we are trying to accomplish? So I wouldn't say that risk theory, risk management, scenario development are obsolete. 
I think we just need a different type of understanding of what they will provide for us. Professor Claudia, maybe you have a different perspective on that as well? No, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm following you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Raquel Lidke asked, uh, is the VUCA, VUCA is the, no, the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and, and big ambiguity uh, to use in this situation? I think the situation is the situation where the frameworks, the non-frameworks don't work. And uh, please give us one example. But but I think I, I think the question is more like the relationship between what we are talking about and the VUCA uh, experiment. So the line breaks. I can't fully hear. Um, okay, I I, Jose, I think. Jose Claudio, can you hear? Or because I can see you, Jose Claudio. Yeah. So it's maybe here. Do you hear me well? Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Better, I think. Yes. Okay. I think that the question is more in the sense of the relationship between VUCA. No volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, and what we are talking about. So what we are talking about: uh, complexity and chaos, and why uh, uh, non-frameworks, most used frameworks, don't work. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if because VUCA is an expression that uh, is the fashion. No, everybody's talking about VUCA and. Uh, I think that uh, uh, you could talk about uh, a little bit about the relationship between VUCA if you are talking about the same thing. <clears throat> well, the, um, as far as I recall, I, I'm not, the, I'm not, I haven't studied VUCA in absolute detail, but as far as I remember it, it stems from the 80s and it comes from the American army. And, and as such, it, wa it was, um, more of a conceptual setup for describing uh, the world after the uh, with it is, and it has been used predominantly to describe the world after the Cold War when the when we had a dominant view of what the world was looking like. So it's, so it's um, I think it, it has a lot of value as such and it offers uh, uh, again it is one of those frameworks we can use to make sense of our world so i wouldn't have anything negative to say about that i think that one is fits perfectly well into what we are talking about what i do think is important for managers is to have more than one framework okay uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I answered the question perfectly, but it's also maybe because I, it's breaking up a little. So maybe I did I answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, Vicente guys asked, what's the difference between change and transformation uh, in relation to solving problems? Mm. So. I would say that, but um, well, this is just a personal opinion that well, transformation is obviously change, but there are many different forms of change, and transformation is one of those. I think that in management, very often we talk about transformation. We are talking about design changed. It is um, we are facing change. Change is something that happens. We may drive change. And transformation is about becoming. It's more about what we would like would like it to be. be like we transform our business from a classical model to maybe a more digital model. So transformation, I think, is a, is maybe the epiphany of uh, of really organizational change. It's like the top part of the ladder. And transformation is. Uh, in that in that way becomes more i think maybe part of um, if i understand the cor correct uh, question correctly is transformation only one strategy no is tra is transformation only one methodology no but i think that what really differentiates is that transformation 
has a purpose. It has a designed orientation to where are we going to end up. At least for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that we are reaching the end of our webinar. Um, thank you very much, Christer. Thank you, Jose Claudio. Thank you for uh, all of you that are uh, attending this webinar. Uh, uh, I don't know if Christer and Jose Claudio would like to, to give us uh, final words or a final message to, to our audience. Well, I can just start and say thank you so much for inviting me to take part of this. And uh, it has been a pleasure. I think this is a fantastic opportunity to have a chance to, to, to talk to some people and share some opinions. I hope that I would see some of you in person, live at one point. Um, but I guess that time will tell. But, but perhaps our creativity will find a way for that to happen. So thank you all of you and thank you, St. Paul, for setting this up. Over to you, Jose Claudio. Thank, thank you very much, Christo, to be to be virtually with us. It's a great pleasure. Uh, we are learning a lot every time that we met. And uh, I have here, uh, uh, I have write down our meeting and I have here like three pages of of <laughs> of ideas and uh, and uh, I will share with that everyone uh, uh, but I think we we get there and that's the important to make produce our time so thank you very much to be here and thank you everyone to join us in this morning thank you thank you so much so thank you everyone. it was a pleasure uh, receiving you here in our virtual room uh, and I really hope as Christopher said that we can uh, meet meet each other um, in person um, very soon. Thank you very much, and bye-bye. Uh, bye-bye.